Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the 16th meeting in 2013 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Can I remind everyone, please, to turn off or at least turn to silent their mobile phones and other uh, electronic devices to avoid them interfering with the sound equipment. Uh, item one on the uh, agenda, uh, can I ask members if they are content that we consider uh, our draft report on Bannockburn 2014 in private at this and future meetings? Yep. Thank you. That's agreed. Item two on the agenda, we are taking evidence uh, on Scottish Enterprise Annual Accounts 2011, 12 and Spending Plans. And I'm delighted to welcome this morning Lena Wilson, Chief Executive of Scottish Enterprise, who's joined today by uh, Ian Scott, Chief Financial Officer, and Julian Taylor, Executive Director, Strategy and Economics. Welcome to you all. Uh, I think before we go into questions, uh, Lena, you've got an a introductory statement you'd like to make. Yes, convener, thank you very much. So, convener, members and clerks, good morning, everyone. It's very nice to be back. It doesn't seem so long ago that we were here in front of you, so it's nice to be back again. Uh, when we were here in October, I, I shared with you our draft budget at the time, uh, and I did make a commitment to you that in these challenging times, we would work to make every penny of that budget uh, count to be even more transformational for Scotland's economy. So about the economic environment, despite some continuing challenges in the global economy, we are beginning to see some promising signs, and I think it's very important to focus on that. It's not all doom and gloom. We've seen two consecutive quarters of growth. We've seen an improving labour market with latest figures out last week showing the biggest quarterly increase since 1992. And we have greater levels of confidence in areas of the economy. The latest Bank of Scotland PMI report highlighted that private sector expansion for the seventh consecutive month hit a 12-month high. But we do also know that the world is changing and the global economy is definitely changing along with that. And for Scotland to remain competitive, we have to be even more ambitious, even more transformational in everything we do, and that means making even more tough choices. And over the past year, we've seen some very, very positive results from this relentless focus on growth that I've been talking to this committee about. We supported a record 2,096 companies to target new overseas markets last year. That's an increase of 52% on the previous year, and I know that's something that the committee very much wanted to talk about last year. We've seen 229 high-value international projects expected to increase export sales by £818 million over the next three years. And Scotland has attracted more than £500 million of capital investment and other investment through inward investment in the past year. Our Scottish Investment Bank has helped secure £80 million of private sector funding for Scottish firms. That's about £2 to £1 for every pound to, uh, that we invest in the public sector. And we continue to work with the very best Scottish companies to unlock their potential. Uh, companies like Wilson, Skyscanner and Enermec, uh, who have all made the headlines in recent weeks uh, for winning new business, exporting, innovating and expanding. So what about our business plan focus? Well, earlier this month, we published our latest business plan to show how we intend to deliver even more. Uh, and it sets out how we will try to squeeze every drop of value from, for Scotland's economy from the investment that we make. It is about staying on course. It's about doing more of what we know is working, and we've got deep evidence to support that. But it is about continuing to try and do it better, to try and do it faster. It's about driving greater investment in innovation and capital projects to make us more competitive on the global stage. And that's why our priorities unashamedly remain the same. Renewables, growth companies, innovation, international trade and investment and the low carbon economy. We'll also be placing much more emphasis on driving greater investment in innovation and capital projects to make Scotland much more competitive. These are all areas that we've prioritised because we know, because of the deep evidence that we have, that they will have the biggest return to the Scottish economy. I am confident that in this delivery plan, based on some of the strongest evidence and analysis that Scottish Enterprise has ever had, we can demonstrate how we continue to deliver and stay focused on the very best growth opportunities for the Scottish economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, as you know, the, 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 the committee is very interested in... Uh, Scottish Enterprises Forward Plans, how it will support economic growth. The particular focus of this session is, how, is, is scrutiny of, of, of your budget plans and your forward plan, how you use the resources you're, you're being given by the Scottish Government to, to support uh, your strategy. There, there are probably quite a broad range of issues I think we want to address. Um, I know members want to ask about um, uh, R&D and commercialisation. Um, they want to ask about um, creating high-quality jobs. 
uh, access to finance will come up, I'm sure. Um, renewable energy and support for that will come up, uh, a keen interest of the committee, uh, and also looking at the balance between supporting domestic uh, uh, companies and inward investment. So there may have been quite a, a wide range of different topics we'll, we'll want to cover. So um, I've, I, I always say to, to, to members that they can keep their questions as short and focused as possible, and uh, if the, the responses can be as short as focused as possible, we've got quite a lot of ground to cover and we get through it uh, within the time allocated, that would be very, very helpful. Um, can I maybe start off with a, with a question um, I put to Highlands Islands Enterprise last week, and I'm sure you've, you've probably looked at the, 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 the session from then, in relation to the um, strategic forum. Um, the uh, savings from the strategic forum were, were projected to be £20 million in 2012-13, going up to £25 million next year and £40 million the year after. But uh, in the spring budget revision, the savings for 2012-13 were reduced to just £5 million. Um, now, Scottish Enterprise are, are a key player in the strategic forum. C can you explain why there's been that substantial cut in the projected savings through this new initiative? Thank you, Convener, and, and indeed I can, and then I'll perhaps pass to Ian for some more technical explanation. If you recall, and we discussed this uh, last year, the strategic forum savings were savings that it was hoped would, would be um, affected throughout the public sector. The Strategic Forum partners, and there are five partners, the element of that for us was five million to be shared across. So, in effect, the five million is the amount that is represented across Visit Scotland, Scottish Enterprise, Helms Enterprise, Scottish Funding Council, and Skills Development Scotland. Uh, and in effect, that's been top slice from our budgets, and we've already taken account uh, of that. So, um, outside the five million, it was expected that that would be found throughout the rest of the public sector. So Scottish Enterprise is actively playing its part and we will deliver all of the savings that uh, you know, we've committed uh, to do, do so. Do you want to add anything yeah, to that? If, if I can possibly add to that. The, the, the £5 million uh, that was uh, kind of mentioned to the previous committees was uh, related to joint projects that we're doing with other strategic forum partners. Um, in addition to those uh, joint projects, each of the partners will have done the, their own efficiency savings. And as far as uh, we're concerned, um, in addition to that, we've made further savings last year in areas such as marketing costs, facilities management, staff costs, and particularly pr procurement. Um, those savings, uh, we're still working out the exact figure on that, and that will be published later on in the year once the final accounts are prepared. But I'm fully expecting uh, in total that to come to an additional six to seven million pounds, I think it'll be in that area. So over and above the joint projects that we're doing, we're making much bigger savings that goes towards that overall target. So, so I mean, is it fair to say that the uh, originally projected savings of 20 million in 12-13, in 25 million in 13-14, and 40 million in 14-15, are we still on target to achieve these, or, or were these over-ambitious? We, across all five of the companies, I'm not, I'm not sure what kind of full extent uh, that, that they're going to do that. I would imagine that we would be able to achieve that uh, through the combination of the joint projects and the individual projects that we're doing. Although, as Lena said earlier on, those original targets uh, were meant to be uh, achieved not just by the five strategic forum bodies, but in, in addition to ourselves, uh, by us kind of showing the types of joint projects we could do if those were expanded across the rest of the public sector bodies, then that would that would achieve the kind of 25, 40 million pounds that we're looking at over the next two years. That, that's that been more difficult to try and achieve, as, as you can imagine, but um, that was certainly within those original plans. As far as Scottish Enterprise are concerned, you think you're doing your bit in terms of and making more, very much more so. I would say it's more than double our bit. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Can, can I ask about another, another subject that, that, that we, we touched on when we, we took evidence on the Scottish Government's budget back in, back in autumn, and that's the question of um, switching uh, funds from resource to capital, which was, which was you know, very fundamental to the Scottish Government's economic strategy in terms of finding money to support uh, shovel-ready ready projects and uh, create employment. In the, um, uh, in the uh, original plans published at the time of the spending review, the, the figure that was allocated for the resource to capital switch for the enterprise agencies for 2012-13 was 95.9 million. Now, in the uh, latest um, budget plans, uh, the total figure for the enterprise bodies is 30.9 million. That's 24.2 for Scottish Enterprise and 6.7 for Highlands Nineles Enterprise. So that's less than a third of the original sums that were highlighted in the um, spending review. 
why, why has there been such a, a reduction in the, in the sum being switched from resource to capital? I suspect Ian's going to get his speaking very early on in this committee today, but I am going to uh, allow Ian to give you the, the technical answer to that. Well, did, just looking at our public business plan, we maybe just want to double-check some of those figures. I, I'm not aware of the ones that, that, that you're talking about there, uh, uh, Chair. The, on, I think, page 35 of our published plan, uh, we're showing an anticipated net transfer of grant and aid from revenue to the capital budget of somewhere between £27.3 million and £52.3 million. Uh, and that's just the Scottish Enterprise element of that. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure the, the, the details of Highlands and Islands, but I think it would come to more than £40 million between the two of us. Well, the figures I got from Spice say that um, in 12-13, in the Scottish Enterprise figure is £24.2 million, and uh, in 13-14, £50.7 million. Highlands and Islands figures are on top of that. They're £6.7 million, 12-13, uh, and £18 million in 13-14. Uh, but you know, whatever, it's still substantially less than the 95.9 million that was in the spending review. So I'm just wondering why these figures are not matching up to what was originally being proposed. I, I, I would have to go away and look at that to get any exact answer on the movements on that. Uh, I, knew, I do know since the spending review through to uh, the published figures, uh, we have um, we've increased the amount of additional income that we're getting in, and if that's capital income, then that's less of a transfer that needs to be made. We're still uh, incurring that expenditure and capital expenditure, but if we're getting additional income coming in, I know we're doing that, and I know Highlands and Islands are doing that, uh, that may be offsetting the amount that needs to be transferred. But the overall level of uh, capital expenditure that, that we're looking at for next year is still in the region of 130 to £155 million. Pounds. Yeah. Well, maybe if, if, you, if you could write to us with, with more detail I'll on that, that. And, and if it's helpful, I'm, I can share with you afterwards you know, the figures we've got from Spice about the the allocation, because it does, it does look like it's substantially less than, than, than was being originally proposed, okay, which, I, I mean, that. given that, you know, this was a key part of the, the government's uh, strategy to, to, to create jobs, I think it's quite an important point. I yeah. think it is a point, important point, convener. I am just concerned that, that you don't have figures that match with our published figures, so I, I would like to clarify that. You can do that. Right. Uh, okay, um, Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Peter, and good morning. Uh, I will keep my uh, question very short and hopefully very simple. Um, through your submission, you talk quite a lot about the creation of high-quality jobs. What do you mean by high-quality jobs? Well, there are, I, well by ha it's a very general... Uh, well, good morning, Dennis, first of all. It's a, it's a very <laughs> uh, general def definition. Uh, what we mean is that we want jobs in Scotland that are as sustainable as possible. So if we think about how we attracted inward investment uh, through the 80s, for example, and into the 90s, maybe some of those jobs were easier to, to move away again. So an inward investment, a high-value job, means a job 20% uh, above the Scottish average and rich in R&D. So an inward investment, that's why we separate out total jobs and high-value jobs. When we talk about high-quality jobs, if you think about entry-level jobs at a call centre, for example, the way that Scotland has moved on in business services and, and uh, call centre services is uh, bilingual, trilingual, technical support. So adding value and moving up the value chain as much as possible in every industry uh, and to make sure that you know, the supply chain from the entry level jobs all the way through uh, are employing our college leavers, our graduates. They tend to be better paid. They tend to be more sustainable. So we just want Scotland to be a high quality location in every industry. So, I mean, basically, there is some focus on uh, entry for graduates. Uh, are you also looking at the uh, equality agenda and trying to try and uh, ensure that, especially females going into STEM subjects, for instance, and, and those jobs, uh, there's a better balance? Because at the moment, obviously, uh, the, the balance of especially young women going into those areas uh, is fairly chronic, actually. <laughs> It's not, not uh, you're, you're absolutely right, it is fairly chronic and it isn't just the post, the, the first destination post college or university, it's actually getting our brightest and best generally, I think I've talked to the committee about this before, into the STEM subjects where there are job opportunities and particularly young women. Um, I was at the Scottish Funding Council board just two weeks ago talking about this uh, exact point, working with them to think how we can attract, we've got women in engineering, women in technology, I speak regularly at those fora um, and you you know, I think I've also said before, if you're a young woman coming out in Scotland at the moment studying engineering or IT, the 
you know, the companies are going to be crying, crying out for you. We also see companies like Steel Engineering, for example, with their Tresta Academy, um, their first young woman, I think she's uh, about 18 or 19 now, first female welder. Well, that's a great role model. And I know she's been doing lots in colleges and schools as well. So we, we do quite a lot to encourage that. Julian, did you just, want to? Just to so can I maybe just add, add to that two, two things. Every single project that we appraise and approve requires an equality impact assessment. So we really deeply try and understand all of the equality issues of all of the projects that we have in line with legislative requirements and a stronger promotional agenda. Secondly, uh, all of the sectors that we work with, with our partners as part of the Team Scotland approach, have under development and some implemented sector skills plans, those also address equality issues. So, so there's, there's quite a comprehensive approach to ensuring that the issue is tackled baseline figure um, for what you would consider a highly paid job? A highly paid job? Yeah. You got a baseline <laughs> figure? I mean, you talk about highly paid or whatever. Is there a baseline figure for what you would consider it, someone in a would, highly paid sector? Well, well in, 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 as I said, for a high value job, we would say 20% above the Scottish average yeah. would be a higher value job. Um, P, to P is, is dependent on sector, uh, dependent on experience and skills. So, you know, f we wouldn't we wouldn't go to that detail for a, a minimum baseline. But 20% above the Scottish average is what we would regard a higher value job. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. That's good. <coughs> okay. Thanks, Dennis. Um, right. I think we'll, we'll we'll move on and, and talk about um, commercialisation of R&D, which I think is a subject some members are interested in. I'll bring in uh, Marco Bianchi. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning. It, in looking at the papers we had for today, there were a whole list of targets that were met or exceeded, but obviously, being a committee involved in scrutiny, we're interested in the one or two that haven't been met. One of them was the target of uh, between 65 million and 75 million of additional business R&D investment from uh, Scottish Enter Enterprise Assisted Projects which uh, only resulted in an outturn of 56 million. Can you briefly explain why that target wasn't met? Good morning, Marco. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, this is a perennial issue in Scotland. Uh, we, in terms of OECD rankings, perform less well than our competitors in business expenditure in, in R&D, although our general expenditure, so we've got Baird and we've got Gerd, uh, general expenditure in R&D actually fares very well, so our universities. So the trick is really to get as much of that as that university um, R&D expenditure commercialised as possible uh, into companies. And uh, we've done a, a lot of work this, this year. I mean, the, the 58 million was a 6% increase uh, on the previous year. Uh, and uh, represents 10% of the total bird in Scotland. So although this is a difficult area, we are have seeing traction and we are seeing an increase. Inward investment is very, very important here. Um, the vast majority of our R&D in Scotland comes from our larger firms and in many cases from our inward investing firms. So it's very important to work with those firms and then through the supply chain get more investment in R&D. Funding for that becomes um, very important, so we've oriented a lot of our funding towards encouraging innovation, and we've seen a big uptake in that, and towards R&D. But although it is a, you know, it's a figure I would, I would like to see significantly increase, we have seen an increase in the previous year, so we are making some traction in what I think is a difficult environment. And all of our R&D expenditure, remember, is also match funded. It's it's you know it's normally about 50, 50, 50 in terms of the the business. There is a really quite stark contrast in the Scottish economy between the levels of business expenditure and research and development and higher education expenditure and research and development. We top the OECD in one and we almost bottom it in the other. What are fundamentally the structural obstacles that you're trying to overcome here? I think uh, well well if we if companies uh, we can encourage companies to be more internationally oriented then they tend to invest more in innovation R&D. They tend to invest more in graduates and they tend to be invest more in leadership. So if we can encourage businesses generally to be more ambitious, to be more outward looking, more international looking, it tends then to follow that they are more innovative and invest more in R&D. If we... Uh, do you mean domestic yes, companies? Domestic companies. Yes, domestic companies. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And also domestic companies that become part of the supply chain for the large global firms, they tend to invest more in R&D also. 
I think that we still have some way to go in terms of our interface with businesses and our universities, and that's something else I was speaking to the Scottish Funding Council about, about making it as easy as possible. Um, so programmes that, that bring, bring graduates into businesses, they tend to be more enlightened, make links back to universities, uh, focusing our high growth support much more on commercialising our great science. So the, it's a multifaceted approach to this and there's no silver bullet. If there was, we would be in a much better position than we are. But I think fundamental of this is encouraging the level of ambition and internationalisation. So is there any tension then between the desire to promote internationalisation in domestic businesses and therefore boost R&D that way and trying to encourage R&D inward investment? Not at all. In fact, it's a completely virtuous cycle because if we can bring high value inward investors into Scotland who invest a great deal in R&D, they will tend to demand the same from their supply chain and encourage their supply chain and the quality of everything lifts up. And at the same time, if we can encourage more businesses to be more ambitious, to look to global markets, then the whole quality of being in a competitive global market is much higher than just being in your domestic market. So it's actually highly compatible, I would say. No tension at all. And with a specific focus on university commercialisation, what I've heard from university commercialisation departments is a real lack of access to finance in the early stages for those commercialisation opportunities. The, uh, it was put to me in layman's terms as the, the dragon's den step when uh, the idea exists but there isn't the immediate access to equity finance. Is that an analysis you would share? I would say that any great idea, so a, a great idea for a product or service for a growing market uh, with a good leadership team doesn't struggle to get funding. So we, what we need to do is help early stage companies make the case better. Actually, we work with a whole number of pre-revenue companies, many of them university spin-outs. And if you look at some of Scotland's recent successes, they've been university spin-outs. So there's, there's not a barrier to that. What we do have to do, I absolutely agree, is make it easier for, for that to happen, make much more porous boundaries between universities and the business world much more accessible. But we're seeing some great examples with what Strathclyde are doing around renewable energy, um, with what Edinburgh does around informatics, with what Napier University is doing around whisky as a, a, a byproducts as a fuel and commercialising that. There are lots of very good examples of that. I think it's, it's also important to say that we've changed our focus um, Scotland performs really well compared to competitors on, on the first steps of spin-out. And we used to work very closely quite early on in the process. We've changed our emphasis to work at the stage you're, you're referring to. So you'll see in the plan that we have a target to support companies that will generate £5 million of revenue over five years. That's, that's quite a high threshold for a company coming through the spin-out process. But we're on track to hit the, hit the target in between 15 and 21 companies over three years. So by changing our focus and just moving that a little bit later, and also focusing on, Lena mentioned, people that the company building aspects are where we can bring the expertise that's often held by academics alongside commercial expertise from, from other companies, indeed tapping into, for example, our Global Scott Network. So it's quite, it's quite a sophisticated process. So access to finance is important, but it's a component of a, of a variety of factors. My final question. Looking at all this and, and looking at the, the history of the level of expenditure on research and development in universities, you see that it has been very, very high for a very long time, and business expenditure has been very, very low. How can that disjoint have continued? How did we get to a place where we have such an imbalanced amount of research? Why has that not been able to be bridged in the past? This is an opinion, so it's, it's, it's not fact. It's, it's you know, definitely not the font of all knowledge on this, but being in economic development for a long time, I would say that the very helpful changes we've had in how universities are incentivised and how they're funded much more to be uh, contributors to economic development has been very helpful. If you look at companies like Finland, for example, uh, Norway universities are expected to contribute much more in terms of economic impact, so the commercialisation becomes very important. I do see a move in that direction in Scotland. I see very positive relationships with the Funding Council and with individual institutions. Um, so I, I think uh, learning for learning's sake, research for research's sake is a, is a very good thing, but from economic development terms, we want as much of that to be oriented as possible. And I think 
incentivizing funding in that direction is is a very good thing, but I do see that changing. This is an issue um, of a great deal of interest to members. I've got, I've got three members who want to come in with follow-ups. Um, start with uh, Chick Brody. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Just, just uh, following on from the, the, the question that uh, Marco has put, if I go out and did, he go to Stanford University in California, there is a much higher level of awareness of entrepreneurship than if I talk to some of the universities here. What do we do to, or how can we encourage uh, professors and lecturers and researchers that uh, it's not just the papers on the, on, on the, the new products or new services that we want to see, but we actually want to see these products go to market. How do we, and quickly, how do we uh, change the mindset of those in the universities? That's a, a very, very broad question, and I'll, I'll certainly offer some opinions based on my travels and uh, experience. Stanford's a great example because, of course, we have a fantastic relationship between Edinburgh University and Stanford and on you know voice recognition technology and software and informatics and actually Edinburgh do a terrific job uh, and one of the highest we have in, in spin outs in Scotland around that work in informatics so you know th there are some fantastic examples of this I think there's a there's a you know there's been a long-standing cultural issue um, maybe not so much of a problem with Scotland but the US has definitely definitely grasped that entrepreneurial culture and society values entrepreneurs, society values people who have tried and failed and, and tried again. I, I think there's, it's changing in Scotland. So, for example, with universities, we have Scottish Institute for Enterprise, which is actively encouraging um, university students to, to set up uh, you know, businesses. We have, I gave some examples earlier, but lots of examples of, of academic, of academic spin-outs. So, you know, that is changing, Chick, but, you know, what I want is a culture in Scotland where people do try and they keep trying and we are international oriented and ambitious and positive and we talk about the world with our young people at primary school. So all of that cultural shift, I think, would, uh, you know, add to exactly the kind of culture that you are you are talking about, but I do see some very very good signs, uh, you know, of this occurring. Look, I don't. Other questions. You're changing the subject. I'll no, come no. back. I'll come back. I'll change the subject. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll come back to you. I'll let I'll let Dennis and then Mike in. Yeah. Uh, very quickly and very briefly. Um, do you use the Global Scott, Scott program um, to support your R and D? Global Scott is absolutely uh, invaluable, uh, Dennis. It really is. It helps us in so many ways. Um, one of the fundamental things that Global Scots do is just galvanise that ambition uh, in terms of, of encouraging. We do master classes, uh, but we, where we have Global Scots, particularly in uh, technology, very senior technology positions in companies, whether it be in the energy sector, whether it be in microelectronics or whatever, we use them to pair them with Scottish companies, uh, which does lead to that. I couldn't give you a figure, but it's definitely an area in, in, in which they play. We did have a very, very senior Global Scot uh, as the president of National Semiconductors, for example, and he did a great deal for a whole number of Scottish technology companies. Yeah. McKenzie. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, I read some interesting research recently that suggested that um, the, the length of time that um, the Japanese are prepared to um, consider an investment over uh, was something like, on average, seven times that in the UK, and that the Germans, on average, consider investment periods of 12 times that in the UK. I just wondered how much that kind of culture and the banking culture that goes along with that, um, that looks at or demands immediate returns, impacts on their ability or the ability of our companies to consider research and development. Um, and, you know, do, do you feel that that's a factor? Um, I think that's a very interesting uh, observation. I get we're, we're Big, big issue questions this morning, uh, uh, convener. I mean, I, I, I certainly think we use Japan, which you do know very well, the German environment, less so, uh, definitely longer term cultures. But actually, that's why our business plan it is so important that we hold our nerve for the long term. That's why we're sticking with these priorities. Uh, and one of the challenges in running an organisation with in-year budget management and, and 
financial years that you know just just with 12 months is that continuing that uh, is an issue i don't know julian if there's any specific research that's been done on this in scotland no, but I, th um, I think it's, 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 it's a fair point. So therefore, the challenge for us is to think, what could we do about that? And the, the leadership challenge of ensuring that companies have the ability to absorb, or the jargon is the absorptive capacity to bring on boards, new technology, new, new, new ideas, is something we would focus on. So helping individual leaders in companies think beyond the next, the next quarter, the next year, and trying to... So you can do it at a, at a company level. I think the, the, other, the other point to say is ensuring that innovation isn't just about technology. So we're constantly using our radar to think about the short term, the medium term and the long term. But I think it's, a, it's a, an issue that faces many economies. And they, yeah, the, the Japanese and the Germans probably, they have a, the, the German banking system, it's, it's not just longer term, it's community based in its perspective. There are lots of cultural issues here. So there's no, no particular research to draw on to say it's a particularly Scottish issue. You can see the good examples from, from elsewhere. But I think we, as a development agency, we need to focus on the characteristics around leadership that can help any company think beyond, certainly beyond the next quarter. But short termism is definitely an inhibitor to long term growth. And I just wondered, I mean, just very briefly, um, it seems to me this is not so much about your internal culture, but about influencing the, the investment and the banking culture in Scotland uh, and persuading them to take the longer view. Because my experience seems to su suggest that lots of companies would be very willing to take a longer term approach w w with, you know, more significant investment in R&D, but they go to the bank manager and the bank manager says, no, I'm only interested in this year. You know, could I make a very short response to that, please? I think there's a, a bigger point here to, uh, about the role of Scottish enterprise. Increasingly, our role has, hasn't just been about what we deliver. It's about being working in the widest possible partnership, influencing others, bringing all of our knowledge and information to bear, opening it up, uh, not being uh, precious about anything. And we spent a huge amount of time with the banks last year and actively working with their frontline people to help them understand how businesses grow, actively working and helping companies make a better case. So actually we have been devoting a great, there's been a big shift over the last few years in Scottish Enterprise in terms of not just what we deliver, but how we work with others and what we influence and that we can be a, a, a thought leader, a commentator because of all this rich uh, evidence that we have. Just before we, we, we leave this issue of, of um, R&D and commercialization of, of research, can I ask you about the um, Intermediary Technology Institutes? Because I remember being on, a, on the predecessor committee in session two a long time ago, and uh, there was great excitement about the launch of the ITIs, uh, what they were going to do to fill this gap between the universities and, and the marketplace. Um, there was a, a report I, I saw in the, in the Sunday Herald um, uh, in March saying that uh, for the £231 million investment from public funds over 10 years, the return uh, was only £600,000. I mean, first of all, uh, do you recognise those figures? And, and if so, what went wrong with this? Because it seems a huge investment of public funds to get very little coming out at the, at the other end. So you're right, that has played out in, in newspapers. And as we all know, we don't always believe absolutely everything we read in a, news, a newspaper. Um, so I'm very happy to provide further data on, on that later on. Um, the ITIs as initiative was a bold initiative, and it's important, uh, uh, you know, that we we don't stop thinking bold, about bold things to do and, and taking chances. And what we didn't anticipate was that the economy would turn out the, the you know the way that it has. However, we have seen some very significant successes from ITIs. What I was not happy about, and, and uh, you know, and certainly uh, my predecessor towards the end of, of his term, was that uh, they were becoming expensive institutions to run. So we took the decision to bring it in house, to rationalise our costs, to align it much more with the work of Scottish Enterprise, and to make sure it was you know much more lean. Um, so we do have some very good uh, results in life sciences and in energy, for example. There are some projects that are still running. Uh, we haven't yet seen everything you know follow through from this so the 600,000 that you're talking about is one part of an interim uh, part uh, of that program so um, you know there are lessons to be learned 
uh, we took a decision which came under a, a lot of flack and scrutiny at the time to close the institutions down, to bring it in-house uh, and to make sure it was much more cost effective. But uh, a lot of these programmes are, are still running. And also to uh, what Julian said earlier about our whole approach is, is much more about the commercialisation and actually working with the high growth companies as part of our overall approach. Um, maybe add something to that. Thanks, Lena. The I think the six hundred thousand uh, that, that you mentioned there, convener, is the uh, absolute cash return that was generated at that point in time. Clearly, the the investment was into quite a lot of uh, significant uh, intellectual property, and I know uh, certainly since then I've been involved in a number of projects where we're looking at creating companies, as we were talking about earlier on, that can actually exploit that IP. We're not going to take a huge cash return from those companies or they won't actually get going, but we're taking a share and an equity stake in some of those companies so that as the companies develop and do make some money out of those, we will get a much bigger return on that at a later stage, but it could be five, ten years away from now before right. we get there. Yeah. Uh, even given what you've said, it does look like a very, very low return compared to the investment that goes in. Are Scottish Enterprise doing or have you done any, any audit of ITA to see what lessons can be learned? Yes, yeah. so uh, quite a few evaluations um, of it and, and that would be part and parcel of everything we do and these are openly and readily available and I'd happily get anything we've done around the committee. Yeah. There's the cap. So the cash return that they were talking about there, which I say will come in a bit later, but there's also the return on the economy of that and actually the GDP increase that, that's actually generated from those companies when they do actually get up and exploit that IP, which is very similar to even like the grant schemes that we've got. We don't get money back on grant schemes, but there's actually a, a big impact on the economy and we'll see the same coming through some of that expenditure from ITIs. We have gone to great lengths to try and tell those who are interested, uh, who you know write the stories, that... It isn't about a, we're not looking necessarily for a cash return, we're looking for an economic impact. And you have modelled that for the, for the yes. ITIs? Yes, we yes. have indeed. Can you, we have. And you, can you share that with us? Yes, we can. Yeah, that would be very helpful. Yes. Okay, um, we'll go back to Chick Brody. Thank you. Uh, I want to start with a retraction. Um, some years ago, under your predecessor and in another life, I wrote a highly critical letter about Scottish Enterprise. I, re <laughs> I retract everything. I think there have been huge, huge uh, steps being taken by, by the agency. However, uh, we talked about new business, uh, about knowledge transfer, R&D from the universities. Can I ask, there's another leg of the enterprise <coughs> business in Scotland, which is the business gateway. How are we interacting, how are you interacting with them in terms of finding the winners? I mean, are they capable themselves of finding the winners that they can move through the leagues to the Premier League? Um, the business gateway is a, is a very important part of the landscape. Um, and, and what I won't go into again is the we have a business gateway. That was the decision to, to do that. So we just need to make sure that everything we have works uh, very well. Uh, we have seen, since I last reported to you, some positive uh, you know, results. Uh, we have seen more, I think we had a rejection rate, I can't remember the exact number, was it 23% 20, of a kind of rejection rate of companies that the business gate would be, would be uh, referring to us, that would be able to go into, I hate to use jargon, but our growth pipeline, the growth companies that we would then take on to be account managed. We've seen that fall to around 18, 19%. So that tells me that there's a better understanding of what we're looking for in the business base, that we're working better together. We don't want a, a rejection rate of 19%. We want it absolutely seamless so that there's none, but that's moving in, in, in the right direction. So there are some recent indicators that tell me that that's you know, working better. Um, are they the overall economic development strategy of the country, or are they too localised? Well, all economic development happens locally, right? So businesses are local things, and it's very important that that's why we have 12 offices all over the country, so that we're, you know, we're, we're you know, giving local services. Um, the Business Gateway have, you know, it's a very broad church they have to serve. It's hundreds of thousands of sole traders to small businesses. And I think what's really important is this development of the web portal uh, so that you know, it's very easy for businesses to get information that you know they don't have to be passed from pillar to post. Um, you know, I, I think it's very important that Scotland remains a 
consistent in its offering. And what I would never want to do is see go back to a, a fragmented approach to see such differentiation that businesses can get highly different things in different areas. So we must guard against that. Um, but I, I think local delivery is, is not, not an issue in itself as long as it's consistent and high quality. Just one more step to add to that. Something we've started recently is to work with every single local authority on an area-by-area -area basis to review the entire business base to get a mutual understanding of every company that wants to work with the public sector and to work out almost from fresh what assets there are locally and who, who, would, who would be best suited to the account managed process that we've got and who would be best suited to the gateway. So a chance to go back to first principles with the local authorities again to make sure all of this is working. Encouraging, but at the end of the day, uh, what I'm looking for perhaps is a more structured approach from them as well to say, well, here are the areas that we're focusing on. Make sure that, that it, you know, there's a fit. I'm not saying that's the total priority, but there's a fit. The same, by the way, I think applies to uh, what is a, a bit of an anarchic um, part of the enterprise sector, which is social enterprise, which we can talk about at length. Uh, 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 some other day. Can I just ask, looking at you, the business plan, and looking at the uh, last year's accounts and, and you know all great stuff. Do you and, and looking at the account management plans that you have, uh, which plans are, do you have the bandwidth? Does, does Scotland have the bandwidth to handle all this? Um, I wish I had that problem. I wish that we had so many fantastic growth companies battering our doors down that I had to be you know, screaming for extra uh, bandwidth. So in terms of support, I think I said to this committee before, um, we want to work with as many companies as we can to get them growing, uh, internationalising, investing in R&D, creating, you know, jobs at all levels of, of the chain. We are only limited by the the kind of uh, universe of companies we have in Scotland that, are, that want to do that. So we said last year that we want to increase the amount of companies we account manage by 20%. Um, we've seen a, a, a significant increase in, in, the, in the last year, which is great. Uh, overall, um, you know, we are seeing that moving in the right direction, but we're, we're limited by the number of ambitious companies we have, not by our bandwidth to be able to The amount of it. credible business support people that are available in Scotland, because the big challenge for business gateways or social enterprises, i.e. The, the, the people that are fed into the pipeline, it's not, access to finance is, is a problem. But as I, when I talk to them, the big problem is knowing how to get the products or the services to market. Do we have the tangential skills through business support people, and I know there are some, and some very good ones, but do we, is that limiting you know, you know, what you would like to see? Well, we saw an extra 80 companies. So we, we increased our portfolio by 80 companies last year in terms of the overall amount of companies we account manage, and we absorbed that absolutely fine. Uh, we, 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 you know, let people go in back office and we put people to the front line. 80% of the staff that join Scottish Enterprise join us from the private sector. Uh, and that's important for exactly the reason you raise, which is that we need credible business support people. This has been a great time to recruit fantastic access to finance specialists uh, from banks and other parts of the economy. And we've you know, m made every attempt uh, to do that. So I have never, ever uh, seen any evidence to say that uh, a, a lack of quality business support advisors in Scotland is holding our economy back or holding businesses back, Chick. Is that why to the expectation on the international front, on the export front, because again, you know, the performance is highly commendable, but you know, we're, we're, we've got a long way to go to the journey's end, or the Nillaby journey's end, but the, the destination points, I mean, do we have the international expertise, the desire to become international, uh, and the general you know, knowledge throughout, throughout the, the, the economy, the companies you talk to, that really fully understand what we were trying to do through export. It's great having whiskey and say they, they clearly uh, have been imbued with uh, export intelligence over the years. But some of the newer companies, you know, do, do we have that international business support? You'll see from our results that there's been a huge increase 
uh, over in the number of companies accessing international markets and uh, behind that an even larger increase in those companies expressing an interest. So that tells me they're coming through the door, they're getting good help, they're getting excited and as we all know you can't go from zero to exporting in a year. You'd be lucky if you can do it in three years, some companies can. What we've done, and I can only speak for Scottish Enterprise, um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't run other parts of the, the, the service uh, uh, support in the economy, but we have put a huge number of uh, staff through a professional qualification. So we have many staff now who are uh, Institute of Export qualified and who have very technical qualifications that you'd normally only find in the private sector. Uh, in fact, one of, our, um, one of our staff got the top award last year uh, in, in the exams for the whole of the UK uh, and became a fellow of the Institute. So we are really professionalising that, and that only enhances the credibility when our advisors are in front of, of, of companies. So admittedly, we just have to keep rolling that out. And I would certainly encourage others to make sure that we get that kind of professional accreditation so that uh, you know companies uh, feel very well supported by very able people. Okay, and Julian will probably know what's coming. Um, we, we, I've no doubt you'll get questions about uh, employees and where are we going to get the employees that we require for the growth, the Scottish economic growth. Do you think we've got the infrastructure to particularly to support uh, international activities? Um, I, I, physical infrastructure. I mean. Scotland has good physical infrastructure. It would undoubtedly, and I. I I'll, I'll, I'll help you lead me to where you want to lead me here, which is about air route development. And, uh, well, I, actually, let me, there is a point on that. I, 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 Westminster is going, going to have, they say, uh, an air strategy, in regard to airport strategy, um, in, in three years. We haven't had one. Should we have one? And should you lead one? And I won't go to leave Presswick alone just now. I'll see you outside. Um, <laughs> should we have... A, a meaningful infrastructure strategy to support international and particularly with reference to airports? We definitely to make, need to make sure that uh, all developments in infrastructure are aligned to our economic ambitions. So, for example, increasing exports by 50% by 2017 means that there are lots of ducks that have to be put in a row, professional advice, the companies we need to support, and infrastructure. And I am in absolutely no doubt that the availability of air routes has a di direct, if positive, effect uh, on internationalisation. And if they're not there, then it can work against us. So we've seen it in the financial services sector. We've seen it in very excited about the air routes opening up to Istanbul, for example. That's fantastic. We've got an oil and gas mission going to Turkey. I'm going with them in September. Turkey is a, you know, very interesting, vast market. So there's a there's a prime example of, uh, you know, Turkish Airlines route to Istanbul. Our mission can get on a plane in Edinburgh, get off in Istanbul and be in their market. So undoubtedly uh, that is helpful. As to who should lead that, well, again, it goes back to the role of Scottish Enterprise. I don't run Transport Scotland. Uh, I'm, I'm not a, a port operator, an airport operator. But I absolutely think we need to step up to our role of influencing, leading, and Julian himself has played a very significant part in working with our partners in Visit Scotland, Transport Scotland, uh, and others to make sure that we're doing everything we can. So maybe just to elaborate a little bit on that. Firstly, we've now got a strong sense of team amongst all of those Team Scotland players. Secondly, much greater clarity on our overall priorities. And to be honest, all of this is about execution. And the proof of the pudding for me was at the World Roots Conference earlier in the year, which is the, the, the dating process for airlines and airports. In Dubai, there was a stand which had Scotland written above it. And it was all of Scotland's airports and all of Scotland's partners working together to promote air connectivity. The only stand that represented Scot a, a, a country. And, and, competitors came up to members on the stand and said, well, that's fantastic because you can say the whole of your government and its agencies and its airports are behind our overall priorities. So that's that's quite a quite a powerful message. The Turkish Airlines route is, is a brilliant example of what that can be, not just in links to Turkey, but then onward connectivity into Asia. Now, we, we want many more direct routes and we've, we've got the ability to support and incentivise routes, but it's certainly a huge step in the right direction. Last small question, probably for Ian. The is that, and I tried, tried to troll through your accounts. Last year, you underspent by 900,000. How did that happen? 
that happens because <clears throat> we have got our three hundred million pounds to spend, and we're trying to uh, nail that right on the on on, on the on the point uh, of the thirty first of March every year. And when you're dealing with um, accruals and uh, expenditure coming in after the end of the year from companies from what they've done to try and actually nail that as we sometimes call it the jumbo jet on the postage stamp is, is quite a difficult thing so I thought that was a marvellous success that we got that to within that uh, £900,000 last to year. To be fair it was only 0.4% of your annual spend but Absolutely. Yeah. In, these day, in these days with budgets yeah. you know, we're trying to you know, with local authorities what have you, make sure they, they spend yes. what they have. Yes. I do regard that as yeah. a success my job as an accountable officer is not to go a penny over budget. That is an extremely serious offence. I think we've got the most sophisticated in-year management. We can flex everything that we can. I, I, with the way that the, 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 the rules go now, you will. my role is to turn in the most modest underspend practically possible. I'd like it to be a penny, uh, but it doesn't work like that. And I think 0.4% when you run an organisation like we do is really testament to our, our very effective management and actually a very big success, Chick. One of the, one of the crosswinds that trying to land that jumbo jet on a postage stamp is the relationship we have with others. We very rarely do we fund anything solely by ourselves. So if, if, if we're in a deal with a company and at the last minute the, 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 the deal goes south, then, then that can lead to... Precisely. Sometimes it's just a week after the end of the financial year. That's still a result to me, but I must not, I'm, I must not go a penny over. Serious trouble for that. Right. Okay, I've got two members who want to come in. Uh, Margaret McDougall and then David Torrance. Margaret, first. Thank you and good morning, panel. Uh, it was really just on the discussion about exports and the international market. I attended a Chamber of Commerce event in Ayrshire last year and the companies were saying that they find it very difficult to get information on how to export and how to get into the markets. <coughs> and um, I just wonder if things have moved on and that, you know, there is a sort of overarching umbrella website that they can contact because they were saying they could go to this or they could go to that. Or there wasn't one which was an overarching website. Has that improved any and so that it's easier for companies to get involved in the export? Market. Good morning, Margaret. We haven't met, so it's very nice to meet yeah. you. Um, wh when was this event? It was a last year. It was in Irvine. Okay, so about a year, about a year ago. Yeah, it might be. Uh -huh. So we we've seen a big push with our um, what was export explorer uh, uh, program was was smart exporter uh, uh, before that. So we've got advisors now going all over Scotland, actually speaking to. Companies that we don't account, account manage necessarily, but the bulk of companies. But any company coming on to the Scottish Enterprise website uh, would then, through SDI, be able to get a link, uh, you know, straight to that. So I'm I constantly reminded that we can never do enough communicating. I'm constantly reminded that you know it's a very confusing, bureaucratic environment out there generally for businesses. That's why I think a move to one single portal for all business services in Scotland is very important. And that's why, um, although you, you could say it was not our responsibility, I put Scottish Enterprise staff into working on that and, and leading that uh, with Scottish Government. So we are nearly there, I think, for global best practice of having one portal for all of our, all of our businesses. But I do understand how confusing it can be when you're running a small uh, business. But um, Chamber of Commerce staff should know where to go and should always be able to direct a company to that. Good morning. Um, staying on the same theme as exports, there's been a lot of focus put on the Asian markets. How much focus has been put on Africa? Because they are experiencing the largest growth yes. in many countries there compared to the rest of the world. Indeed. Uh, for that very reason, I, I put that you know big challenge to our team about a year and a half ago. And in November last year, I was in uh, Ghana. Um, I had the privilege of working a lot in in Africa uh, with 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 the World Bank, and you know knew that those markets were growing significantly. So, West Africa. Uh, um, we're going to put an office in Ghana. We put someone out on what we call a pioneer programme. We've been running these pioneer programmes all over the world to look at new markets where we put a member of staff out for three or four months and their job is to assess whether or not we should be in that market. So we had a pioneer in Ghana and we had a pioneer in South Africa. The decision is that we shouldn't be in South Africa right now. It's much more important for us to be in West Africa on the back of our oil and gas opportunity. Uh, you can you know, easily service Nigeria, a, a more difficult environment from, from Ghana. We're also looking at East Africa 
uh, and um, uh, we had a mission, an education mission out to Morocco uh, last week. Uh, we are looking at um, other parts of, of North Africa, but huge opportunities in sub-Saharan Africa. So we'll have an office in Ghana um, as a starter, and we've got a pioneer in East Africa at the moment, Kenya. in Kenya, at the moment too. So it's, Africa's very important. I, I don't know, the, I, I think, is, is it six of the fastest growing economies in the world in top 20 are in Africa right. at the moment? Right. Right. Could be. right, OK, um, now, Chick mentioned uh, the issue of access to finance. I think Rhoda Grant wants to come in and pursue that. Yes, please, thank you. Um, I, I was just wanting to know what you're doing about helping businesses access finance. Good morning. Um, it, that's formed a, a very large part of our activity uh, over the last year. So I think I mentioned earlier we've had this uh, access to finance programme where we've got a, a finance readiness programme. So uh, that means that we go into companies, uh, help them make the case. Because I think I said to this committee before, we were finding so many examples of companies where the answer was no. But then when we went in, help them make the case a bit better. In quite a lot of cases, the answer turned out to be yes. So we've been doing a lot on finance readiness. We've employed um, people from the financial services community to come in and actually work as finance ready uh, specialists. And we've had hundreds of companies uh, through that program. Um, I don't know, they can't remember. Well, I actually can't recall the exact number, but hundreds of companies that we haven't worked with before through that. We've also worked very hard with the banks. Um, so we've done a lot of work um, with uh, Lloyds Banking Group, for example. Uh, we've uh, done work with HSBC, with uh, RBS, uh, and actually working with their uh, frontline staff to help them understand the challenges that business face, to help them understand how businesses grow. So it, it, it is still uh, an issue. Um, Companies are telling us that it's it's becoming more difficult again, and uh, to to access finance that it's becoming uh, more expensive when they come to renew their terms. So you know there are definitely issues out there, but we've you know put a great deal of effort into that in the last year. Just to, to follow up some some of the evidence of the companies that we work directly with, those we have an account managed relationship with, in any six month period over the last couple of years, about forty percent of them have sought funding and well over 70% of them have been successful in securing the funding that they were looking for. So I think at the, at the top end of the pyramid, if we're working with a company that got clear growth potential, typically if they've been innovating and internationalizing, then we can help them present a case which, is, which makes them successful in securing funding from the, from, from the banks and others. So, so there is some, some positive news in what is a, is a very challenging environment. We also have our own funds that uh, you know, Ian might want to say something about. Uh, yep. Well, I, I was going to add to the to the uh, financial readiness side. I think the number was about 460 companies that our Scottish Investment Bank, that runs the other funds, uh, actually supported last year with particularly intensive uh, financial readiness uh, support for 100 of those companies. And the results we've already seen from that is that 38 companies have received funding in a total of about 30 and a half million pounds. So we're really seeing the, the return on that uh, coming back into the companies already. And some of those companies had previously been rejected by the banks. So that type of support that we're given was very much fundamental to making sure that the proposals that they put forward are seen to be robust and are therefore accepted by the by the banks. What kind of things are, are you coming across when you're helping businesses who were turned down by their banks, you're going in and uh, giving them advice? Is, is there a theme developing from that, what's happening to companies when they go on their own or what are they not presenting properly? I think we're finding that they're, they're not selling themselves well enough so, them, you know, when you're going to bank, you're, you're marketing, you're, you're selling, you're trying to uh, gain confidence in your ability to pull off your proposals. So just helping them tell their story a bit better, helping them bring much more clarity to the markets they're in. Uh, we've actually seen some fina technical financial skills that have been missing. If you think of smaller businesses where, you know, owner managers and small businesses are trying to do everything. They're trying to be the HR department, the finance department, and so actually bringing some technical skills in presenting their case better. Sometimes it's been some quite simple things 
um, through to the more complex technical. Now, if that leads us to then say there's a gap in the market or there's a particular skills offering that we then have to put in place, then we'll certainly uh, do that. Uh, and if, if it leads us to even think that we have to upskill our own account managers more and look for more technical financial specialists in Scottish Enterprise, we'll certainly do that. But I think, in essence, it's been about how they present themselves and how they present their case and how they sell confidence about themselves because that's what financial institutions are looking for they're looking to be confident in the person that they're lending to as Lena was saying that, that needs to be backed up with robust financial information which is obviously what I would say in this position um, and that we, I was surprised when um, when Kerry uh, the, the head of our new, uh, Scott, the new head of Scottish Investment Bank uh, gave us that feedback uh, when their executive team was looking at that recently but and we can bring in other support as Lena says to be able to, to help the companies actually deliver on that to banks. I mean, you, when, when you're saying that you know 70% of your growth companies are only 70% are getting because those are companies that you obviously see the the, the ability to grow in, and only 70% of them will get bank funding. What alternative um, sources of finance do you then go and look at, or what's out there, or is there something missing? We've got a very active, uh, so, so we can we can have uh, lending, but we can obviously have venture capital funding as well. We've got a very active angel community uh, in Scotland. Uh, we've got our own funds through the Scottish, uh, you know, investment bank, and we continue to plow more into that if if the demand and the uptake is there. And we have seen a larger uptake in our, our, our venture funds and our co-investment funds. And remember, it is about co-investment, so um, looking to um, overseas partners, non-Scottish partners, bringing capital into Scotland. Uh, we've seen some global Scots starting up. Um, Rock Spring is a, a, a life sciences fund started by a global Scot that is bringing tens of millions of pounds into Scotland with very small leverage. So it isn't just banks. Lending and overdraft is one answer to this. Um, but uh, looking at the angel market, the VC market, co-investment, uh, we've seen some large companies investing in smaller companies uh, from overseas as well and giving them deeper pockets with which to grow. We'd, we'd leave no stone unturned in this area. And at the other extreme are some modern, innovative ways of businesses being funded, like crowdsourcing and peer-to-peer -peer -peer lending, I think, for particular sectors, more creative industries, for, for, for example. So we're also investigating the opportunities there. So, so the complete spectrum, probably banks in the middle, really innovative at one end, and then equity at the other end. I think uh, the, the you know, syndicates, the venture capital syndicates that Lena was talking about, um, come from all over the world. Um, I think out of the all of our co-investment partners, 36 of them are Scottish-based. There's a further 29 UK-based and a further 18 are actually internationally based. So we're bringing or helping to bring that those funds into Scotland to, to help support those companies. And we've, they've already been used for investments in our co-investment uh, schemes that we've got. Uh, brief supplementary check, yeah, just, just on that, uh, we went to uh, Brussels to, <coughs> to talk to the director for small businesses. Uh, we found that there was a fund of about 1.2 billion euros available. It had been available over the last six years. Um, we didn't know because we're not yet, not yet, a member state. So I wonder just you know what relationship you have with 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 the, with the European Commission. Oh, and, and European funding groups. The other thing is I was in the city, the city of London, three weeks ago, and the place is awash with cheap money. I just wonder what the uh, relationships you have or investigations or uh, uh, of route funding from there would, uh, would be. I'll separate both of those out. So we, we have a, a team called Scotland Europa in Brussels. Uh, it's a membership organi organisation. Currently, it reports up through Julian before he takes up his post uh, in Asia, and I'll ask him to say a little bit that. But a lot of their job is to identify uh, sources of potential funding and, and get that message out, not just through us, but through their membership. And we're seeing quite a lot of change in EU funding, the, the Horizon 2020 programme, which will open up a lot of opportunity for Scottish businesses. But I'll ask Julian to say something about that. The London point is very, very important. We increasingly spend a lot of time in London. Uh, we had a pioneer in London a while ago uh, for six months to just identify new opportunities. So increasingly, I find I'm spending time uh, you know, in London a couple of weeks ago. The current Lord Mayor of London is a Scot. 
and it's his job to promote the financial services industry. He is a banker. He has been incredibly helpful in opening up wider contacts. We've got a lot of Global Scots in London. We regularly run uh, events there. And we have our SDI office in Cannon Street in the city in London, and we use them uh, in that regard. And I think the figures that Ian gave you for the the rest of the UK, um, co you know, co-investors, they're largely in London, Chick. So it's very important that we're in London uh, a great deal. But maybe you'd like Scott, um, Julian to elaborate on Scotland Europa? Just very, very briefly, the two major functions. One is to help Scotland collectively secure European funding and really significant changes in European funding um, at the moment. And we've done quite well in terms of positioning the overall Scotland pitch, but ensuring... So why did we Two billion euros. I think, I'll need to look into that. That may be a stone that wasn't unturned, but I'd be surprised if we haven't investigated it and, and looked at its eligibility. But I'll, I will look into that, and if we can, we, we can, we can okay. find out exactly what's 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 uh, available from that. In addition, our ability to influence some of the funding sources. So we need to be realistic about the degree of inf influence that we can have. But through the representation of Scotland Europa and bringing some of our industrial partners to play, we feel as we've been able to influence uh, European funding in favour of marine energy support, for example. So quite a, quite a, a powerful, uh, small but powerful lobby. But we'll definitely look into uh, the, the funds you referred to. Yes, yeah, just very briefly, convener on this. Um, the subject of access and finance, and it's um, in reading your corporate plan, there was slight alarm bells um, ringing in the phrase about, you know, that you're talking about um, companies not having financial literacy skills because um, I have a concern that over over my kind of business career, I remember, you, you know, the days when uh, you went to see your bank manager and the business plan was one sheet of A4. Um, and that grew to 50 to 100 to a telephone directory. And it seems to me that um, we, if, if you look at part of the reason for the credit crunch perhaps was that um, we didn't spot the real risks. It was hidden in the complexity. And that these days, what financial literacy, what's taken for that is actually lots of complexity. And um, the point, the discussion earlier on about fostering entrepreneurship in Scotland is, and that I've met some very successful entrepreneurs over the years, and they seem to be aligned with Einstein when he said, reduce everything to its simplest form. And, you know, do you worry that this trend to complexity under the guise of financial literacy is actually counterproductive? I, I haven't seen any evidence that would correlate complexity with falling standards in financial literacy. And as Ian said, it's only through really the work that we've been deeply doing in access to finance and with the finance ready specialists that we seem to have uncovered this issue. Um, so it's really important that we did and we will definitely do something about it. But I think, Mike, we need to understand it a bit more deeply. However, I would say that reducing burden, complexity and bureaucracy for businesses is absolutely, you know, fund fundamental. And I mean, a lot of businesses that say wading their way, you know, uh, through lots of stuff, whether it be their bank or, or someone else is difficult, is, you know, is difficult and challenging. Yeah. Just that in speaking to a lot of businesses, it seems that the bank's response to um, post credit crunch is to um, increasingly when they're doing their due diligence, to ask for more and more and more information, much of which seems to be kind of red herring information that's not at all critical to the success of the project. Part of the work that we've been doing with the banks and that I explained earlier, so I won't repeat it, but working with them is to, you know, understand what critical information is actually required and ask the right questions of companies. I do have to say, though, that when times were very, very good, there are businesses who got supported that you know maybe shouldn't have got uh, supported and who maybe didn't have to prove as much as they do now. So a balance of making sure you know you're prudent, you're giving the right information, you do have a sound business plan is actually very important. But it's how you can do that in the least burdensome way possible. So I do agree with you. I've got a number of other questions, if it's appropriate for me to ask yes, them now, please. certainly, yep. Uh, um, hopefully not too large a number. Well, well, interestingly though, but that leads us perhaps neatly on to my next question, because um, I notice again, and, and this seems to be new in your corporate plan, a focus on construction as an industry with growth potential, and I would absolutely agree with you 
But the, the big limiting factor there, surely, uh, is their ability to, to, to get finance at the moment for construction projects, both public sector and, and private sector. That's a very good point. And at our executive team, we just discussed this very issue uh, yesterday. I think we want to really step in and face up to the issue that we all find ourselves saying that, you know, the Scottish economy is doing really well. If you take construction out of it, well, that isn't good enough because there are a lot of opportunities, a lot of great firms, a lot of people that work in construction. So uh, finance is, is certainly an issue and, and banks, you know, lending, uh, you know, for, for property, it, it, you know, is certainly an issue. But we just saw an announcement for, a bit, uh, uh, was it, is it RBS doing the tourism there's, yes, a there's a new fund, fund yeah. over 100 million, yeah. I think, yeah. for, for tourism investment. So that's very, very welcome. Um, I think the opportunities in construction, and we work very closely with our industry advisory group on this, uh, tremendous opportunities are around internationalisation, around, around more investment perhaps in R&D, around low carbon, um, better construction uh, technologies, uh, aligning more with the forest industries, looking at architecture and design as an, uh, as an internationalised service in Scotland. So I, I do think there is an opportunity to make a step change in how we look at this sector, how we support it, to be more innovative, invest more in R&D, link it more with a low carbon agenda, new materials, and you know, look look at uh, you know the, the role of architecture and design in Scotland too. So, I think there's more that we can uh, do, and I think uh, you know if we saw more international projects, they would be more easily be funded than the traditional, um, where we've had a lot of exposure for the banks in Scotland. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I happen to agree with you. I think there are huge opportunities there. Um, I, I worry, though, just about the, the you know, and, and I, th I think certainly in the slightly longer term, um, construction will perform. It's fallen off very much, so I think it will, you know, um, we'll see some quite sharp growth when uh, the general economy picks up. Um, but probably the, the, the final kind of area of questioning, that, because I've, I've really got to say that, you know, um, I think you're doing a terrific job, um, but the area that of, of perhaps slight disappointment, and I'm a wee bit puzzled by it, is the kind of failure to meet targets associated with renewables. I um, wonder if you could explain that. Again, some of it comes back to this, um, and I understandable desire to achieve in year, in a kind of 12-month period. So our pipeline for renewables is, is strong. And uh, we've had announcements from, from you know, Gamesa and Mitsubishi and Samsung and the like, and we're actively working with those organisations through their plans. There are undoubtedly issues around EMR, so electricity market reform, and policy issues which we can influence on uh, and which the Scottish Government are actively influencing on, which are affecting decisions. And we've all been reading about that in, in, in the press, and that's not news to any of us. So there are issues about uh, timescales and about contracts. And what we are seeing is some of the timescales being pushed out a little so that that affects in-year target delivery, if you, if you like. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm as confident as I can be with everything I know and all the relationships that we have. Uh, and I've, you know, personally gone to the boards of these organisations, you know, myself, uh, that we have a, a, a pipeline which is, uh, is going to, to bear fruit, albeit that some of our original anticipated timescales might be slightly pushed out. I mean, that's of general interest to the committee because it's also the energy as well as the economy committee. So um, EMR, and I think we've, we've had a number of discussions about that. Um, how, how strong a factor do you think EMR has been there? Or are there other, other factors as well that are uh, impeding us uh, realising these opportunities as, as soon as we might? Well, um, companies want two things, especially in the supply chain. They want customers and orders. Uh, and uh, they want a policy environment that is pro the very thing that they are trying to in invest in. So to that extent, EMR is important, uh, you know, is important to them. Um, and, you know, uh, us working with them to make sure that they have a good order book, that, you know, they get customers. And then we come in on the back of that to make the infrastructure as easy as possible, the supply chain, the 600 companies we're working with as part of the supply chain, the renewable skills academies, the engineering, all of that. But what they need is a, 
a policy environment and an order book. <laughs> really, that's the most important. Uh, that's the most important thing. I, I have more, but I'm equally. Well, I've got two, I've two members with supplementary, so I'm yeah. conscious of the time, and I've got another member who's not asked any questions yet. Yeah. So, so I'll come back to you if there's time, Mike. Uh, Margaret McDougall. That's actually a supplementary on the, the CO2 when the, that discussion was happening. Um, I noticed you, you have exceeded uh, your targets on that, and I just wondered what interventions you were using so that you know perhaps others could do the same. We're very committed uh, to that. So if you you know come into a, a Scottish Enterprise office, you're quite likely to see someone with a headset on, you know doing a, a Skype or we've got a more sophisticated version of that all over the world. We had 12 people on one call, I believe, uh, yeah, throughout, Asia, yeah. throughout Asia the other week instead of actually going and visiting each other. So we've had a travel policy which encourages public transport. Uh, we've invested in technology uh, to do this and you know actively try to, to, to lead this. We have Cycle to Work <coughs> scheme uh, at Scottish Enterprise and uh, very committed to doing that. Healthy working lives, encouraging people to walk more. I mean, a whole myriad of, of, of uh, issues. But technology for um, dispersed offices has been very important to us. Was the question more around the, the companies that we work with? Because, I mean, there's a, a really well, significant well, component I mean, to that as, as well, yeah, ranging from out-and-out out lean production techniques, so looking at just complete savings, particularly through the manufacturing advisory service work, work that we do, right the way through to helping companies explore new markets when they do have a, 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 low, a low carbon product, especially in areas like the built environment or some real specialist uh, companies like the applied sweepers or allied vehicles. So there are many, many different ways of working with many different companies to help them. It is it's a genuine win-win. It's, it's cost reduction and, and CO2 reduction. But I do think we have to lead by example in absolutely everything that we possibly can. Um, staying on renewables, we've had great success in offshore wind because Samson's moved into Fife Energy Park, the area I represent. Um, but how much assistance have we given to wave and tidal companies to go into manufacturing and production within Scotland? Um, I, a great deal. I, I, I think that, uh, and obviously we own Fife Energy Park, so that's very, very important to me uh, as an asset. Um, the, the wave and tidal opportunities are huge. They are longer term. The technology is in earlier stages of development. That means it's more difficult to get private sector financing. So Scottish Enterprise, through our co-investment funds, have come in and uh, in, invested in two of our leading uh, companies um, there, but co-invested with big industrial conglomerates and uh, venture capitalists. So I do envisage that we need to take an approach which reflects the very early stage nature um, of that. I think I said to the committee before, I, you know, our ambition is to have the leading device, a Scottish device. We just don't know which, which technology it's going to be yet. So it's very important. That's why EMEC um, and the Marine um, uh, Test Centre up, up in Orkney is very, very important that you can come and you know test the technology, deploy it in some of the harshest winters in the world. If it goes through a winter in Orkney, it'll survive anywhere, and then do everything we can to get uh, investors into that and get it commercialised. So we're taking a very active interest and putting serious amounts of money into that too. Can I just ask a supplementary on it? Um, there's another company at Five Energy Park, Flu Mill, which is Tidal. Um, and they have great problems in actually getting to the test centres to test their devices. They've actually had to test them in Norway to do all their testing because they can't get any room to fit up at Amy. It's a capacity issue? Yes, it's a capacity right. issue. Okay. I'm actually going up to Orkney in the coming months. I'll have a good look at that for myself, but I'd happily pick that up with you, um, you know, afterwards. I suppose that's a tremendous sign of success if we have a test centre that is quickly you know, get, getting filled, but obviously uh, we don't want any Scottish company not to be able to you know, get access to tested devices. So I'll, I'll gladly pick that up with you. Okay. Um, Alison Johnson. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to ask a question about priorities with regard to domestic or inward investment. Um, is there a priority? Where does it lay? And do you have any, is it growing new or existing Scottish businesses or continuing to attract in inward investment? And do you have any 
evidence about whether it's better to increase the proportion of jobs coming from one or other of those two? Questions there. I'll try and give you a general response. If I haven't picked anything up, and I'm sure my colleagues will come in, uh, please do come back. Um, the vast majority of our expenditure goes on Indigenous Scottish firms. The vast majority. I mean, two thirds, would I be? 80% Eight, of the account managed companies that we work with are Scottish, are Scottish firms, companies, for example. So, so that gives so, you a, a good sense and, and, yeah, and flavour. Yeah. But the myth out there is that all this money is going to foreign investors. And it has been that way for you know tw 20 years. That's not the case. Um, also, 80% of our foreign direct investment comes from companies here who reinvest. So I would make an argument that a lot of those companies become fantastic Scottish companies. In fact, we think of them as a Scottish company once they're here. And the amount of reinvestment that we get from companies that are very happy in Scotland and fight for other mobile projects is actually incredibly high. That's why Scotland has more or less topped the Jobs League for inward investment in the UK for the past few years. So I don't think there's any evidence to say that one type of job is better than another type of job. It's, is that job sustainable? Is it going to be here in the, the longer term? Is it, uh, to go back to Dennis's point about high value jobs, they tend to be anchored more in the economy. They're much more difficult to take away. Um, but inward investment is very important because of the supply chain. Uh, you, you know, it then opens up opportunities for tens of Scottish companies in services and products to actually supply to those inward investors. So high quality in, inward investment is fundamental to Scotland. Also fundamental is growing our own. We need to grow Scottish companies who become big foreign investors elsewhere in the world because they're globalised companies. So both are vital and one is not better than the other. Um, do, you, do you apply any criteria to companies who are receiving regional <coughs> support assistance grants, for example? Um, and speaking about high value jobs, um, are companies receiving funding who use zero hour contracts, for example? And obviously there's the example of, of Amazon who are you know, in the press a lot recently as one of the, the multinationals who have aggressive tax avoidance policies. So do you, you know, when you're looking at awarding these contracts, do you look at whether the jobs really will be high value? And do you look at the other criteria? Okay. So, so there are very robust criteria for RSA because it's a European scheme. So there, there are criteria in terms of, the criteria is normally based on a couple of things, the amount of investment the company say they're going to make and the amount of jobs they're going to create. And the payments are normally made in milestones or trigger points and they're retrospective. You have to show that you've done that before it's awarded. And there is normally a time bound clause for a period after the awarding of the grant with, in which if you reduce in that time, then the grant is clawed back. So to just to answer your first question about those are the criteria. Um, and RSA is, is a European scheme. Not part of the criteria would be this new issue we have in the country with, with zero hours and, 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 and the like. That wouldn't be part of the criteria uh, you know, for RSA. Uh, what we're looking at in terms of economic impact is exactly that, the number of jobs. Um, and um, as I said to you, Inward investment is looked at in two ways, high value jobs, but also total jobs. The high value jobs tend to be about one third <coughs> to 40%, yeah. so around one third of the total jobs created uh, from inward investment. So if you get a company like uh, Teleperformance Call Centre who came into Glasgow, they provide terrific entry level jobs for direct graduates, for school leavers and, and the like too. So we actually need a whole spectrum of entry levels through to high value. But we, we don't currently have criteria around, um, around uh, zero hours. And as far as I'm concerned, as the Chief Executive of the Economic Development Agency, um, taxation policy is a matter for government. And you know whether companies, we would want every company to comply with that. We all would in Scotland. But I don't, I don't set the policy for, for taxation, and nor should I. Could I ask one final um, question on the Scottish Investment Bank? You know, because I think access to finance is a, is a very big issue. I, I know with, with colleagues here, I attended a, a, on a panel Federation of Small Businesses last week, and I think access to, to funding is an ongoing battle for many of these small local traders. Is there a vision for the future role of the Scottish Investment Bank? I mean, 
should it become independent and, and able to issue bonds, you know, as we see in Germany, for example, should it adopt a different model that might be more helpful to these businesses who are still struggling? I mean, I know you were saying earlier that it's a great time to recruit staff who have the expertise um, to ensure that funds do move to those who need it most. But I think this is an ongoing struggle, and I just wonder if that bank could play a part. I guess uh, the policy direction is more a matter for governments than it would be for us to set that, dire that direction. The Scottish Investment Bank is fundamentally important in leveraging additional funding into Scotland. So I think I said earlier, we, for every pound we invest in Scottish Investment Bank, we get two invested from our co-investment partners. So it's very, very you know, important. We put a great deal of our budget into it. It isn't a bank. It's an investment arm. Uh, and it's about helping companies access capital to help them grow. Um, I, I guess there, there, you know, maybe other plans for how that develops. But I think it's fundamentally doing its job as an in in integral part of the Economic Development Agency and doing a very good job. Okay, supplementary point needs to be the last question from Marco Biaggi. Yes. Just following on from a comment you made there, that this. The committee has recently completed an inquiry into underemployment, both in terms of hours under underemployment and skills underemployment. I think twice now you've referred to uh, entry-level call centre positions in the same sentence as mentioning graduates. Could you perhaps clarify what you were meaning there? Well, it, I mean, it's no surprise to anybody that uh, we have uh, a this issue of underemployment with, with graduates. We're going into graduates going into jobs that uh, you might think that they've trained for, for higher level jobs, but we all know that that's, that's happening. So I didn't, it wasn't an intentional, you know, we're not, we're not, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't intentional to, to say that only graduates can go and work in call centres. We've got graduates that work in the renewables industry, that work in food and drink, that, uh, you know, but we, we've all got children and uh, we've all got families and we know that graduates are not all getting the jobs that we want them to get. Take that then as an expression of dissatisfaction with that, and I will let it rest. I, I, it's, uh, I'm, I'm stating a fact. We'd all, we would all like our young people coming out of our colleges and universities to have a destination which is you know, uh, helps their ambition, helps their careers, but we all have to start somewhere. I don't think my first job after I graduated was uh, glamorous in any way, shape or form, but uh, we've all got to start somewhere and we've all got to work up, so it's not a bad thing either. We've all got to go and work hard. Right, I've got two members who, 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 who've caught my eye. If they ask minusculely short questions, I'll let them both in. Chick Brody and then Margaret McDougall. <laughs> Just looking at last, your last year accounts, um, social enterprise between shares and loans has accumulated a sum of £115 million. It's surprisingly one to another to a local authority, which kind of surprises me. Given the conversation that we had before about bandwidth, how do you achieve governance or your part in governance of these companies? What, subsidiaries, generally? Well, I mean, or I, or, or investee companies. Yeah, investee companies. Or investee yeah. companies. Yeah. Um, in many ways, so um, uh, often we're on the board. Uh, we'll, 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 well, we, have a, we have a monitoring team and uh, we, have, we do follow up, we do aftercare, um, you know, we, um, you know, as, as, as any financial organisation would part of the monitoring and, and governance, so we would have a team that, that, that do that, Chick. I'm, 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 um, I'm the accountable officer, so ultimately it all rests on my shoulders, so you know, we want to make sure that that's done, that's done properly. Yeah, we, in all of these cases, we've co-invested alongside other partners, and we are taking, a, albeit the same stake or a, or, a, or a smaller percentage stake from the co-investment partner. In terms of the governance of those uh, those companies, we are a, a very small part of it. We're probably taking somewhere between five and ten percent maximum of these companies. Twenty percent. Give me a low Yes, so yeah. so accordingly, where there's a greater degree of investment, you might, for example. Uh, say that we've nominated, specifically nominated a non-executive to look after our interests on the board. And it would, that would be relative to the exposure. I'm also very surprised that you'd flown £6 million to Edinburgh Council, but that's by the by. We can take that OK. We can, we can explain that to you afterwards, and you maybe may not be so surprised or disappointed. Thanks, and I will be very brief. And this is not me meant as a criticism. The, you have the target figures... You have met or exceeded many of them. I just wonder, have they uh, been set ambitious enough? I, I, um, 
I would say congratulations to the staff in Scottish Enterprise. That's what I would say. We had our highest performing year last year with our lowest level of resources. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that's our job. We're asking businesses, we're asking everybody out there to tighten their belts and to work harder. Uh, so we use our evidence. Our board are the ultimate arbiters of our targets. And they err on challenging and uh, stretching as it should be. And uh, sometimes I'm more worried about too stretching a target and it looks like we don't meet it. So oh, I don't take it as a criticism, but I'm just smiling because you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. So uh, we'd be criticised if we don't meet them and people think they're too slack if we, if we meet them or exceed them. It is what it is and we just deliver for the Scottish economy. Thank you. Right, with impeccable timing, that brings us to the end of our, our session. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lena Wilson, Ian Scott, Julian Taylor, for coming along. Uh, one or two issues I think you said you would follow up in writing, and if you could come back to us, that would be very helpful. Indeed. Thank you. It's our pleasure. Um, and we'll now have a short suspension. Thank you.
If we can uh, reconvene. <coughs> Item number three on the agenda, the uh, committee undertook a number of fact-finding meetings on the regulatory reform Scotland Bill yesterday. We broke into three groups and um, we supposed to get a report back from the three different groups on the key points uh, that were discussed. I just remind members that um, these were meetings in private and the participants um, under, uh, participated on the basis that uh, uh, their contributions would be uh, kept private so the names would not be revealed. So uh, people can bear that in mind. Uh, I think the first group, uh, I'll, I'll ask um, Alison Johnson if you would report back, Alison, on, on what your, your group found, just briefly. Mm -hmm. Yes, certainly. Um, Dennis Robertson and I met with an officer who has experience of environmental health and trading standards, a great deal of experience. In fact, he was absolutely fascinating, and I, I think we could have had twice as long. Um, I think the main points that came up was the inclusion of the economic duty in the bill. He... His his own. It, he didn't feel there was any point in it being there. He felt that it created a conflict with the responsibility of protecting public health and safety. Um, and with regards to the national standards, he agreed that they could create clear expectations, but the guidance on the operation of such standards would have to take account of local circumstances. I'll just sort of um, briefly go through the main points. With regard to the economic duty in the first instance, he felt that could be removed from the bill. He was unclear of the purpose it served and that it created a conflict. He felt that other approaches, such as the existing enforcement concordat, seemed to serve the same purpose. Um, he also questioned whether there's a shared understanding or a clear definition of what is meant by sustainable economic growth. He felt that existing professional standards apply and are promoted well by the relevant professional bodies and that provisions already exist that place the role of a regulator as being a facilitator who creates a level playing field, and that effective regulation really does help legitimate business to prosper. You know, he gave examples. He said, you know, you would rarely see a restaurant closed for any longer than was absolutely strictly necessary, that the officers working in this field really understand this people's livelihoods at stake, so they try to improve matters and, and get things sorted out as quickly as possible, and therefore they are contributing to to economic growth. Uh, an example he gave is, if a business with a significant share in the leisure sector of a large city was diluting or short measuring alcoholic beverages across all outlets, then this has an impact in terms of public reassurance about the quality of what they're purchasing and also impacts on other businesses in terms of being able to compete on an equal basis. Um, given the impact of that business in terms of market share, where would the economic duty balance against the public sector, the public safety considerations? So that was the economic duty. The national standards, he did think there was value in having a national standard, but he, he said it was very important that all, in, all involved in regulatory work across the country understand what's expected of them. There was concern about the level these standards would be set. Large cities such as Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen have high standards currently. He wouldn't want to see them reduced. Um, he had concerns about whether the standards would reflect the practical experience of effective regulation in different areas. You know, he said that somebody in Glasgow, an inspector there might see four or five vans, for example, burger vans in an afternoon, but in Clackmannanshire it could be one or two a year. And that Some people would have great experience and be able to deal more efficiently, this might have an impact on the standard. I think he was very concerned too. He wouldn't, you know, he felt that what might, what might be appropriate in Glasgow wouldn't be appropriate in the Highlands. Um, he also felt that he commented quite strongly on the need for a sort of holistic approach that combined food hygiene and health and safety inspections, and that that happens in larger urban areas. Um, he gave a. He gave an example of, of where this doesn't happen. He told us of a quite harrowing incident where someone had ended up with his foot in a frying pan. Um, a, a, deep, a deep fat fryer. And it's just if we take away food safety from general health and safety, someone in attempting to clean a kitchen oven who'd apparently had found himself standing on top of an oven and had had a dreadful accident. And it was just because he was trying to comply with one set of regulations and had failed to comply with the other. Um, 
Yeah, he, he felt that environmental health officers in smaller areas would, would just naturally be able to have a more direct relationship with the businesses that they inspect. And they'd be able to more clearly demonstrate the benefits of compliance to those they were dealing with. Um, and where enforcement action is required, they're more likely to have a good relationship with their local procurator fiscal through which appropriate measures can be imposed. In a larger area, those relationships may be less likely to exist. But there's more scope to combine inspections for different parts of the licensing regime, and that could aid compliance and operation. And I think finally on the st well, street trader licensing, he was surprised that this issue is, being, is seen as being of such importance as it's a relatively small area of regulation. However, he did note that it's the area in which field environmental health officers are most involved. But uh, I think the concerns being brought up in this committee, it might lead to shopping around to be inspected in areas which are viewed as having less stringent standards than others. Um, yeah, he, he gave an example of a small local authority that has four or five environmental health officers but it's an area that's geographically convenient as a winter base for people who operate travelling shows. At present, the major urban centres of inspection regimes, which have higher standards and more officers dedicated to particular areas for inspection and compliance. And with these provisions, one small local authority would be potentially responsible for licensing 20% of traders in Scotland. So I think um, he felt as well that, that the appropriate resourcing is needed to deliver effective regulation, that the model of funding is based on a per capita headcount, but it might need to be rebalanced to look at the burden of work. And he pointed to the fact that Edinburgh has a phenomenally high number of fast food you know, places and restaurants and so on. So um, I'm sure Dennis may well have some other points he'd like to raise, but yeah, we had an interesting meeting. It's helpful. Thank you. No, no, no. I, I think just the only thing is really to emphasise that there was some concern um, that there is potential for dilution of standards, mm -hmm. and that's something he certainly wouldn't want to see. So it's about bringing maybe other authorities up to the level, say, of Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen, um, uh, as was uh, cited as uh, areas of good practice. Okay. So I think that's fine. Right, thank you. Um, right, Margaret, I think you're going to report on your group. Um, we met with uh, two planning officers who were very knowledgeable in um, what they do. They, just uh, uh, on a summary, they, um, they felt that local authorities were too diverse to have a national standard applied to them. Because obviously you've got, well, take Glasgow and Edinburgh, for example, the, you know, lots of um, listed buildings in Edinburgh and in Glasgow you've got more uh, maybe industrial and uh, disperse problems, shall we say. Um, and they were, but they were very clear that they have uh, sustainable economic growth as their key objective. Uh, in relation to planning fees, there are many concerns about how satisfactory performance might be measured given that it will likely focus on time scales rather than good partnership working and good decision making. And they did go on to say about how do you measure quality of planning decisions and, you know, it just seemed that there was no clear way of how you can uh, measure that. Um, the national standards, I think, I just sort of mentioned that, but the, the local development plan for each local authority reflects the, the issues of the diversity and the concern was expressed that imposing national standards would mean local issues would be tackled, would not be tackled as effectively and it would remove the local authority planners from the process and effectively deliver planning from the Scottish Government. So um, on the economic duty, um, as I said, they acknowledged that um, planners recognise that, you know, that is their job to uh, <laughs> to encourage uh, economic re regeneration and growth. Uh, but uh, planners serve the local authority population and these communities have to have a say in the process. And including that uh, is not always palatable. And also, that also can add to the, the time constraints within it, because if you set that time uh, barrier on, on the planners, 
but they also have to consult with others and they also have to rely on others like SNH to bring in information to them and they don't always um, conform with the timescales. Partnership working with other regulators is good, but their expertise is in heritage or environment and not economic growth, although they may be a high priority uh, now given the national planning framework. So that's basically what they... We felt on that, um, on sustainable economic growth, yeah, they, they did raise several times about how you measure performance and how that would be reflected accurately. And, you know, will it be a tick box exercise? Because it could, the priority could be on uh, meeting the time scales rather than the actual quality of the uh, planning application and how it comes about, particularly around uh, larger developments. And on, uh, yeah, on the planning fees, the sort of sanctions that, were, that have been mentioned, if the planning authority isn't performing and then their fees are reduced, if these fees aren't pooled because that they don't go, they're not set to the planning authority, they go into the larger pool of the, of the council, um, how would that improve the service that they are providing if the funds are reduced? And um, services provided in house by local authorities are not consistent because large lo local authorities will have perhaps ecology and heritage experts in house, whereas smaller local authorities have to get consultants in to do that work, and that's all time as well. Um, they weren't at all keen on the financial sanctions and felt that um, the mere result in local authorities targeting funding and priority on those areas, impacting on the agreed planning targets and not on providing a good overall service. Um, making good decisions is, an important, is as important as efficiency, but the bill is too focused on efficiency. And I think I'm, I'm presuming you'll all get a copy of these notes that um, came from the, the meetings. I don't want to go through all of it, but um, the view was that the planning fee section of the bill should be removed as it is unlikely that it would be able to implement effect effectively given the diverse economy, econ sorry, economies, climate and priorities of communities. Local authorities need the ability to respond to their specific development plans, which may be different to Scottish Government's view of national consistency or a local authority performance. And I'll leave it at that. Okay. And check me where I want to Thank add you, something. Margaret. Check, do you want to add anything? No, basically, it was, you know, the, the planning fees and localism was, uh, were the two main areas. Consent. Okay. Um, well, I'll just report briefly on the, the, the group um, I, I was in. They were very good. Yeah. The, group, the group I was in, uh, Mike McKenzie and Rhoda Grant and I met um, a cross-section of the business community, uh, ranging from quite substantial house builders down to very small micro, micro businesses. Um, quite a, a broad-ranging discussion, which uh, inevitably went to subjects not really relevant to the, the regulatory reform bill. Um, um, but nevertheless interesting uh, and it's good that they engaged. I mean the themes I think that came out of it were pretty consistent in relation to national standards. Um, there was a concern about local authorities uh, inconsistently applying uh, national policies and regulations and they would prefer better uh, consistency. An example given of that was somebody running a taxi firm where the same um, uh, rather different uh, standards are applied by different local authorities and people operating in different areas have to comply with uh, different standards which adds to cost. In relation to the economic duty, perhaps unsurprisingly, I think there was general support for that. They felt that the economic duty would be helpful. Crucially, they wanted to see uh, regulators, including local authorities, as facilitators and enablers who would be there to assist people doing business rather than just putting obstacles in their way, which is the way they were perceived at the moment. And probably the strongest message that came out from the businesses was they wanted to see a change of culture amongst um, regulators and local authorities to be much more uh, business friendly and trying to help them through the regulation rather than just trying to be uh, involved in uh, uh, standing in their way. 
around planning fees, uh, the, the issue that came forward was that planning fees are a very small part of the total cost of a planning application, and um, the changes around planning might not make a huge amount of difference in terms of some of the other issues around planning. There are also quite a few specific examples of legislation where um, they feel there's, there's duplication. An example of this was the building standards uh, and this interplay with the um, requirement of local authorities to acquire and require um, uh, carbon reductions through the Climate Change Act. And some local authorities are using this in effect to enhance building standards, which is making it more difficult for house builders to get on and do uh, what they want. So, I mean, not, not, I think, a surprising message to any of us who were there from businesses, but very much focused on making it easier to do business and uh, making the, uh, uh, the regulators more, more helpful rather than just strictly applying the rules. Do you want to add anything, Mike or Rhoda? I would just add that um, with a couple of people there from very small businesses and um, the, the difference that you get from bigger businesses who are um, able to, uh, I think, engage more effectively with regulators and whose who's, um, uh, prime concern uh, tends to focus on technical issues with regard to um, efficiency of regulation and the small businesses who are just bewildered by the complexity of it and you know really aren't able to negotiate their way through what can be really quite a complex uh, minefield. Yeah, and I think all of that, I think the other thing that kind of came through clearly was kind of legislation and regulation where it actually mattered. The, they talked about no legislation surrounding things like surface water and who was responsible for it, and yet talked about you know carbon reduction as being over legislated, where there was kind of different things um, doing the same thing. So you were almost different parts of the legislation were fighting against each other, um, and the same with just organisations that were, um, I suppose making that legislation come to life where, you know, different departments had no view to what another department was doing. So you were getting different messages from the one organisation and there was, as Mike said, just an absolute confusion as to, you know, how the, they weren't speaking to each other and kind of no understanding of what was going on. Okay. Right. Well, what we'll do is we'll circulate around to everybody the, the, the notes from the various meetings so that you can... You can see what the other meetings had to say. And um, I think we can bear in mind all these issues when it comes to the formal witness sessions as we take forward scrutiny of the bill. Okay, and with that, we'll move into private session. Can I just, just yeah. I went to <coughs> the David Hume Institute presentation last week on competition, uh, and regulations came up in that. I mean, I know that's, we'll address that after September 2014. But, you know, I think with, with a view to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but in, in going through this, I mean, it's quite clear that there is an overtone, not directly, but there is an overtone of you know, competition regulation and, and, and how that applies. Okay, thank you. Right, we'll go into private session. <laughs>